Good afternoon. I'm Matt Furman. I uh, run corporate communications for Google, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Ralph Nader. You all know him well. In 1999, Time Magazine picked him one of the most influential Americans of the 20th century, and um, it's uh, for good reason. As you all know, he's almost single-handedly started the consumer movement in this country, and when he founded Public Citizen in 1971, he uh, took the lead in creating some of the most important consumer protections um, Americans now enjoy. Uh, he's run for president five times, including this run. Three times. Three times. Officially. Oh, officially, excuse me. Three times. Uh, he has um, inspired some and frustrated and angered others. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome here today on his third run. Is this now the third? Mm -hmm. or, okay, on his third run. Ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Nader. So uh, Ralph's asked that we stand for this. I, I feel like I'm before the English bar or something. But uh, I haven't done this since the third grade. Okay. I'm going to start off with some questions, and then we'll open it up to the uh, to the audience. Um, I think it's a way of getting to know you better. Uh, it might be helpful uh, to ask you sort of a simple question. Who are the political figures of the 20th century you admire the most, whether they're American or international? Um, well, I like Gandhi. I love Gandhi. Uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. Robert La Follette, great progressive senator from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Wayne Morris stood up against the Vietnam War, Senator Wayne Morris. There are really a lot of them. And uh, there are a lot of citizen leaders, too, uh, that most people don't know anymore. The great uh, urban organizer, Saul Linsky. Um, uh, Cindy Sheehan, who resurrected the anti-war effort in the United States in 2005. The important thing to know is there are a lot of, a lot of people to be inspired by. And if you were to be president, who would you model yourself on? Who's occupied the Oval Office in recent history who you admire and would want to copy? Not very much. Uh, because the corporate constraints in Washington are really overwhelming. Uh, and even back in 1938, Franklin Roosevelt sent a message to Congress asking for a commission to investigate corporate power concentration. And he said in the message, um, when government is controlled by private economic power, that's fascism. Well, there's nothing compared to today with the global multinationals controlling every government agency and department inside and out, even the Department of Labor. So they, they really didn't have a chance or they weren't transforming leaders. There are little things you can pick from different uh, groups. You know, Lyndon Johnson, the civil rights uh, struggle, he wasn't expected to sign and lead on the civil rights, for example. But by and large, we have this, the, the civic community has not been strong enough to liberate the presidency and to get the best out of the presidents. So given your frustration then with uh, modern American politics, why would you want to be president? I mean, you've accomplished so much outside uh, the White House, outside Congress. Why would you want to enter? Because I interpret the Constitution as liberating the political and civic energies of the American people, that the government, one of government's roles is not just to set standards and to uh, distribute uh, services and build the public works. It's also to affirmatively liberate the civil, civic and political energies of the people by providing ways, very easy ways, for all kinds of people to band together. Insurance policyholders, let's say, in the health insurance area, uh, taxpayers to deal with the grotesque uh, uh, tax system in this country, uh, renters uh, banding together. Uh, there are thousands of groups that would band together to redress the imbalance of power in our country vis-a-vis uh, -vis insensitive government and giant corporations that there's no facilities to do so. You know, we talk a lot about rights and remedies. I mean, a, a right without a remedy is a weak right. I mean, if, some, if you have a right to go to court if someone wrongfully injures you, you, you should have a remedy. You should be able to get damages, et cetera, provide evidence. But I would go one step further. Uh, a right without a remedy, without facilities to organize and deal with preventive action and foreseeing and forestalling injustice and problems um, is not much of a right without a facility. Labor unions are a facility. I mean, the collective bargaining, for example, in the industrial age. But we don't have many facilities. And the real disappointment is the Internet has been lousy in that respect. 
I mean, don't get me going on the internet. Well, the, 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 internet, here, right? the, the internet is great for retrieving information and telling people about events. Uh, it hasn't shown much by way of mobilizing, except on internet I- issues. Mobilizing citizen action across the broad spectrum uh, of challenges that have subordinated citizens to the supremacy of corporate and commercial interests. Well, Barack Obama is raising a million dollars a day on the internet. You don't think that's a form of that's, mobilization? No, because look at him. He, he doesn't take on corporate power. He wants to expand the military budget. Uh, his Senate record is mediocre. He's sided once again with corporations against uh, citizens. My running mate, Matt Gonzalez, has a rundown on Obama's record on our website, votenator.org. You know what we have to do, Matt? We have to make very clear that technology does not have its own imperative. We have to make very clear... Remember when they said about nuclear power in the 1940s, they were saying uh, it's going to be too cheap to meter. And, of course, they never focused on the radioactive waste problem. Too cheap to meter, not focus on the radioactive waste problem. Uh, if you look at a continuum, we're being overwhelmed by bits of information. And presumably we want to integrate those bits in information and move it to knowledge and, and move it to experience and judgment and wisdom, okay? That's really the sequence. But we're so overwhelmed with information that people are literally paralyzed from moving it across the continuum to uh, the connection between knowledge and action for a better for a better society. I don't see the Internet doing that. You know what it's like? Have any of you studied biology? Have you ever studied the exudations of a par- paramecium where it's choked by its own exudations? That's where we are now. I used to say when we got the Freedom of Information Act of 74 through uh, Congress and signed into law, that information is the currency of democracy. I now look at that phrase, which is a nice phrase, uh, I look at that phrase as grossly incomplete. It's got to move to a pattern of knowledge, judgment, experience, wisdom. Uh, I guess it should be said, of course, Ralph was sharing with me that he and his sister, who is in the crowd, both still use an underwear typewriter yeah. and are not on the computer. And I asked him, how is it he managed to avoid the computer? It's in his face so much and everyone's face so much. And your answer was, it was easy. It was easy. The computer avoided me. I mean, what, what, what does it do for me? Uh, I got plenty of information to work on, more than I can ever use. Um, you know, what does it do for me? I mean, I've got assistants who can get it quicker um, using the web sites and so on, but... It doesn't mean anything for me. Because I don't like to erase, I've disciplined myself to almost write first draft, final draft. If I was on a computer, I would be very sloppy because it's so easy to correct things and so on. I've never seen more illiterate writing than young people coming out of the Ivy League schools with a computer. They spend their entire day looking at a computer. Hey, pick up a book. You know, feel it. Rustle its pages a bit. Talk to each other face to face. Do we really know what's happening to us? When we look at screens 50 to 60 hours a week, kids today are looking at screens 60 hours a week. Television, screens, video, screens, internet screens. They're living in virtual reality. They, they can hardly put four uh, literate sentences together. You know, like, sort of, cool. Yeah, you know, it's just like, who needs Esperanto? These kids get along on 200 word vocabulary. <laughs> it's just, I've been through so much of this technological twit stuff in our fights. You start with the auto industry. <clears throat> you go out to the proving grounds in the 1950s and 60s. Huge styling pavilions. Then you say, I want to see where the safety engineers work. They got like a wall, hole in the wall. They didn't have the facilities. So what happens is the whole industry subordinated engineering tech, uh, integrity to stylistic pornography and horsepower. And people were dying and avoidable crashes and preventable crashes through more crash worthiness every day. Millions of people injured in 50-year period and killed. And yet, boy, they had the best scientists and engineers money could buy. But the auto companies had too much power. They had too much power. They controlled the technology. They controlled what engineers were taught and not taught in, in, at universities. And then what broke it? What broke it was General Motors <coughs> hired detectives 
to go after me, and they were caught trailing me down to the Senate office building. We had big Senate hearings, one thing after another. Suddenly, millions of people realized they can have seatbelts, padded dash panels, collapsing steering columns, strong door latches. In that sense, information was liberating. It, it, it truly was. But we really have to be very skeptical because we have such a complex technological world that we keep backing up means to means to means to means. We don't have time for the end. What's it for? I mean, has life in America really improved in the last 25 years with the information revolution? With the information explosion? I mean, look at the poverty. Look at the misery. Look at the crumbling public works. Look at the differential in wealth. And you can go on in one indicator after another. The bottom line is, if you don't have distribution of power, technology can become a monster against the very people it was supposed to serve. You touched briefly on your successes with Unsafe at Any Speed in the yeah. automotive industry. Do you, do you fear or sense that those great accomplishments, those monumental achievements, have been overwhelmed by your current political status as a, as a, as a gadfly from time to time? Well, they've been shut down. I mean, citizen groups can't get much done anymore in Washington. I mean, as a, you can't get congressional hearings. Hard to get the Food and Drug Administration to even respond to your petition. Um, there are just 35,000 corporate lobbyists uh, in town, full-time. There's 10,000 political action committees pumping money. And they put their executives in high government positions. I mean, your company is now coming up against the cable and telephone companies on net neutrality. You'll get a feel of the power, if you haven't already, of what's going on. Uh, so when you can't improve your country by participating in, in your own government, what are you going to do? You can quit and go to Malibu and watch the whales, or you can go into the electoral arena and encourage a lot of people to run for local, state, and national office and, and churn up the system, put the progressive agenda uh, on the table. I mean, you look at the issues that are on the table for us and off for McCain, Obama, and Clinton on our website, votenator.org, and you'll see the difference. And there will be more issues that are on our table, whether it's single-payer health insurance, which 59% of the doctors in a recent poll support, along with the American people, one after the other. Cutting the bloated military budget takes over 50% of our, of our federal government's operating expenditures. And there's no more Soviet Union. Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex. It's, it's run amok in Washington. That's why we don't have money for public works, for repairing schools, libraries, clinics, sewage treatment systems, drinking water systems. So you see, we got more information than ever before. We can get it faster than ever before. We can even double check it better than ever before. It's not clicking. It's not clicking. Uh, too much power in the hands of the few over the many. And the one institution that can countervail economic power is the government. And I've just indicated under whose influence that is. So it's really very serious. You know, your generation, the young generation, is the first one polled believing that they're not going to be as well off as their parents. Now, it doesn't apply to you, you know, Google employees. But just think of the average person coming out of college. How do you get at affordable health insurance? How do you pay those exorbitant interest rates on the student loans? Uh, how do you have your, your job not outsourced to China or India? Anything that goes through software is, is exportable now. Even Reuters is exporting uh, its reporter uh, jobs. And how do you get affordable housing? That's pretty, you know, it's pretty daunting. And yet the GDP keeps growing. The wealth keeps growing. The capital keeps growing. The technology keeps booming. So you... You know, we used to call people who are bedazzled by new technologies, a little rough phrase, techno-twits. They're so bedazzled, they don't ask the fundamental questions of, where's it going? Who's it helping? How's it improving the strength of our democracy? I mean, that's your business. I mean, you're supposed to be breaking the paradigms and changing the world. Let's see how you do in the presidential debates. Let's see if you can break the lock of the private corporation called Commission on Presidential Debates Controlled, created and controlled by the two parties. And guess what? They don't want number three. They don't want number four. What if when Google started, uh, the, the search engines uh, said, 
we got plenty of search engine companies. What are you doing? We don't want you to, to get into the marketplace to show what you're doing. Well, in politics, presidential politics, that's what it is. Here in California, every congressional district is either gerrymandered Republican or gerrymandered Democrat. There isn't even a two-party contest. How can you have an election without that? It's a coronation. The hardest thing, Matt, in life is to face reality. When you grow up being educated by myths. And when I was a little kid, I ran home to my father and said, Daddy, Daddy, I just learned who discovered America. He said, who? I said, Christopher Columbus. He said, really? I thought there were a lot of people on the shore receiving them. <laughs> I, see how we, 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 cut, we, we just basically cut out the native, uh, the native peoples. Talk about ethnocentrism. So, you know, what are you going to do about president debates? How are you going to break it up? How are you going to uh, provide powerful alternatives uh, that only Google uh, with uh, YouTube and its huge range and, and perception of its power can do so that we open it up to millions of Americans. You know, if you don't get on those debates, you can't reach tens of millions of Americans. We campaigned in 2000, filled Madison Square Garden, Target Center, Boston Garden. Two percent we reached of the people we could reach on one debate. What you do is you, you start with the sequence. Without people knowing, nothing happens. Without people having a sense of injustice, nothing happens, even if they know. Without their being able to mobilize together, to rally together, it's not going to happen. And just take it step by step by step until change occurs for the better. And the kind of change that leaves options open for revision. And ask how your business is going to push that along. Because you're supposed to be breaking the paradigms. That's your, you know, that's your image. But, you know, you can break the paradigms in ever narrower circles and still think you're breaking the paradigms. Are you going to break the political paradigms by facilitating things? I mean, it's not your business to, you know, run somebody for office, you know, just to facilitate uh, things. I've gone through so many of these technologies. It's pesticides, herbicides, motor vehicles, flammable fabrics, pharmaceuticals, biotech. That's another techno twip, uh, doused technology. What is biotech? It's changing the nature of nature, right? And its technology is way ahead of the science. It should be its governing discipline. You have a foundation, don't you? Yes. You need someone brilliant in charge of that foundation. <laughs> we do. Somebody named Larry. Well, let's open it up to questions. You know, anybody going to go to the two microphones there? Sorry, you want to get started? Here, how you solve those problems. The, the prescriptions are all over the place. We have more problems than we deserve and more solutions than we apply. Take energy. A rational society would move for dramatic energy efficient technologies and use and applications of solar and geothermal. We're still up to our neck in fossil fuels, and now they're talking about government guaranteed nuclear power plant resurgence. It is not prescriptions. That's the first priority. It's developing uh, an open analytic approach uh, to these problems where we get rid of the taboos and we get rid of the self-censorship. I, I, I know you self-examine yourselves as a company more than most companies, but do you ever have aggregations where you admit to where you are self-censoring yourself? You're supposed to be the least self-censoring company of any size in the country. Innovation, challenge, skepticism, and so on. But self-censorship is a very, very mutatable syndrome. That's really the problem. We have solutions up to the sky in one area after another. Uh, roof crush standards for motor vehicles, right? Uh, generic drugs, uh, organic agriculture, <clears throat> personalized public transit. The brains in this country have given us far more solutions than we have the democratic power to apply because 
Big companies have vested interests in existing technologies, for one. They have a vested interest in the internal combustion engine. They have a vested interest in oil and gas and coal and nuclear. They don't want to let go. Solar energy is a displacement technology. They're trying to buy up more solar capacity and slow it down. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with what are called non-technical obstacles to change. Political power, too concentrated. Economic power, too concentrated. Look what's happening in Wall Street. What, what chance do investors have in getting the truth, getting clear accounting? These companies have incredible computer capability, and they have lied and faulted and dummied up their accounting more than any company in the last 100 years. With, with all due respect, though, what's your... What's the solution? I still hear more vagaries. Do you have any plans in the next The, solu- the solution is to open up the political process to more candidates, more agendas, public funding of public campaigns, instant runoff voting, proportional representation. In, Ch- in Germany, if you get over 5% of the vote, you get over 5% of the parliament. That's the, why we've heard of the Green Party in Germany. we got a two-party elected dictatorship. It's got a complete lock, has this absurdity where you can win the popular vote and still lose the presidency, electoral college. And we've got to open up the political process. We've got to open up the university process. I mean, the party line at universities is staggering. They're supposed to be the free academy. They're being increasingly corporatized. Look at Berkeley, BP, Novartis. They're moving right into the faculty, shaping research priorities. And people who challenge it are slowly, you know, slowly ostracized. And that's, that's what we, we have to open up the system constantly. That's what you're all about. But if you're not careful, your good intentions in opening up the process in ever more creative ways will be turned into slogans. I know this is good for a longer discussion, but Next to start. Uh, hi, Mr. Nair. Thank you again for uh, coming to Google. Um, Thank my you. question is regarding um, sort of grassroots organizing. I've noticed that the media is very powerful in as far as framing the debate um, in terms of many issues. And one of the things I noticed in 2004 was that um, there wasn't a lot of publicity towards your candidacy. And I was wondering uh, whether instead of doing more of a national presidential movement, um, how come we don't see a lot of uh, movement towards smaller grassroots um, organizations, maybe small candidacies, and don't you think that's a better way to build up um, sort of these policies being implemented instead of having a national candidacy? We want to do both. I think, you know, the presidential approach gets uh, broad, broader uh, exposure, and then you campaign around the country as we do in 50 states. No other candidates go into 50 states. Uh, we connect with citizen groups who are struggling at the local level on a lot of the issues that we try to deal with in the national level. For like a couple of days ago, we were in Los Angeles. There's a certain toxic waste area of work called the Downies uh, uh, place. It used to be a a NASA installation. It's very, very contaminated. The workers have come down very ill. Six of them uh, came to meet with us. You couldn't believe how sick they looked. And no one's listening to them. OSHA's not listening to them. Center's not listening to them. Health department's not listening to them. You think that's rather strange, right? Because that's what they're supposed to be doing. It isn't strange at all. I'll tell you one thing. Um, never before have members of Congress gotten away with never answering requests. They don't even write answers to letters. They don't even email you anymore. I've never seen this uh, in an open information age. And you can hammer them with emails. It doesn't matter. Emails are too cheap now. You want to reach a member of Congress, start with person to person or letter or telephone. I was going to say telegram. That's going. Uh, the last thing is email. They're just flooded and, you know, they just doesn't have much effect. Uh, Always ask yourself, if information is so well distributed, so accessible, et cetera, et cetera, why aren't things getting better? Why are things getting worse? Why do people have less voice? This idea that it's going to get... We had the first conference in the United States on the computer and the consumer in 1973. 
You want to talk about going back a long ways. And the, the, the computer people of those days came in. It's going to revolutionize the marketplace. You can't believe the comparative information that you'll be able to get. You won't have to over overbuy your air conditioning because you can just put in a, a square footage and so on to your house and tell you how much air conditioning uh, power you need. It hasn't worked that way. Uh, I don't know why. We should now have extremely powerful consumer uh, facility groups bargaining collectively with corporations like Metropolitan Life or Allstate. It's not happening. There is so much deep thinking that is required and to replace the euphoria of rapid technological change. It is like, uh, it's like cocaine. Fat, it's addictive. Fast, exciting technological change. I was once, 30 years ago, up in a Hanford nuclear res- a reservation. I was debating Ralph Lapp, the physicist on nuclear power. And uh, anyway, we go back and forth, and a guy gets up, and he's... Uh, uh, and, uh, I was uh, urging them to convert to, be, to become solar energy engineers. They really liked that one. They were nuclear engineers. And we asked them, why do you like nuclear? Uh, why don't you go for solar? And he said, solar? That's just sophisticated plumbing. He said, you can't believe how intellectually satisfying <laughs> the atom is, nuclear energy. I mean, how do you analyze something like that? Someone wants to be intellectually stimulated, sees Solar is sort of dull, although it's no longer viewed that dull, uh, and stays with an industry that hasn't solved where it's going to put its deadly radioactive waste, for starters, for a couple hundred thousand years. Sorry for the length. Go ahead. Um, I liked what you said about paralysis, and um, I was wondering if you think the paralysis and then maybe the other side of that, the, you know, people being oblivious to what's happening... I was wondering if you think that comes from the people in power sort of being aware that they're doing this, or maybe do you think the people in power are just doing what they think is right in the moment and maybe they just don't understand the full impact? Well, let's go down the abstraction ladder from how you ask the question. Just make a list of everything that a majority of the people would like to see in this country. Okay? The the people are saying yes. Then ask who's saying no. Who's saying no to a living wage? Who's saying no to full Medicare for all? Who's saying no? Who's saying no? It's uh, overwhelmingly, it's commercial interests. McDonald's, Walmart. The head of Walmart makes $12,000 an hour, roughly, eight hours a day. It's got a million workers making seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dollars $11 an hour before deductions. So this is what we have to get into our heads. We don't have to be ideological about it. We don't have to be capitalist versus socialist. Uh, I happen to believe giant corporations violate capitalist principles. They don't allow their owners to control them, shareholders, mutual funds, pension funds. When they get in trouble, they go to Washington for a bailout. <laughs> You're supposed to meet the market test, and if you can't make it, it's over. They, I mean, look at how they disadvantage smaller companies. There are other examples. But uh, there is a... Look, we all avoid confronting reality. It's the nature of the human condition. And the people who break through are people who say, face up to it. Face up to a president who is a recidivist criminal and the most impeachable president in American history, says prominent law professors who don't have an ax to grind and former head of the American Bar Association, horrendously shocked by what's going on. Criminal war of aggression, systemic torture, uh, arresting thousands of Americans and, th- and throwing them in jail without charges, no habeas corpus, uh, spying on thousands of Americans without judicial warrant. That's a five-year jail term under FISA. And th- the Democrats don't want to face it. That's quite a legacy for future presidents, that kind of monarchical, dictatorial outlawry. So I can say this to this audience because you're supposed to be chronically predisposed to facing up to reality, chronically. You have all the ecology here, all the ecology to facilitate concentration. You don't have to go to the cleaners. You don't have to go to an outside fast food restaurant. You got Japanese toilets that take care of everything. (laughs) 
you know, uh, t- so you concentrate. You don't have hierarchical offices. You have space. You have light to free the mind. But the mind is the greatest source of deception if you're not careful. Even if you think you're being creative. You can be creative in a smaller and smaller, more and more specialized whirlpool. But the thing that keeps you going in a larger frame of reference is say, what are the main problems in the world? And what, what, can, what can we do beyond providing easy retrieval of information? And how are our policies creating new problems? Privacy, for example. How are they creating new problems? Um, how you have to deal with the communist regime in China on Tiananmen Square, for example. And it's so. You have unleashed enormous freedom to think dynamically, creatively, independently. But the forces of power will come on you the way they've come on all creative thinkers, if you're not careful. And if you do break through, and what you've created becomes the conventional wisdom, guess what? That may be the very biggest obstacle to the next breakthrough. Look at Microsoft. Can you imagine a company making more money on a cruddy, operating system, and a stagnant set of applications because it had a monopoly, very clever monopoly. You're leaving Microsoft in the dust. They don't know what to do with you. I mean, you tripped them up on the Yahoo acquisition. Balmar is probably looking at the sky in Seattle or something. That's become stagnant now. It can, the movement from entrepreneurial creativity stagnancy is faster and faster. Yes. So you, you mentioned uh, entrenched corporate interests and uh, stagnancy. And uh, I, I have a yeah. friend up in Washington who owns a little tiny car company. And one of the problems he has, uh, he, he wants to build electric cars. Sorry, he wants to build electric cars. Yeah. And uh, in order to meet the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, he has to build like 12 of them and crash them in, in various particular ways. And it's basically this enormous barrier to him getting going. I mean, we talk, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's very easy to bootstrap something like an internet company or a software company. But to do anything in the range of transportation requires really tens of million dollars of startup costs. And you know, I look back on how did this get started. Of course, you were the instigator of what became the Transportation Safety Administration. So my question was, how do you prevent something which is well-intentioned to increase everybody's safety and, and prevent it from coming something that becomes a big bloated bureaucracy of, you know, these are the hundreds of pages of stuff you need in order to, to market even your first car in America. Well, I almost caught 90%. Somehow it wasn't coming through to me. But when we created the legislation for the Auto Safety Agency, any agency, any regulatory agency have an independent research facility to deal with innovations, to deal with their own testing, because they don't want to tell, they don't want to have the industry say, uh, we technically can't meet your standard, your tire standard, your brake standard, your crash rollover standard. And one of the things the auto companies did when they slowly got more and more control and got their people in the auto safety agency was to get rid of the research safety vehicles, which were the model. You know, in 1980, uh, the, the Department of Transportation contracted out to Cornell Aero Lab and others to build a 3,000-pound a safety vehicle suitable for mass production that would sell for very competitive prices that could protect you in a 50 mile an hour fixed barrier collision uh, and protect you from a 40 mile an hour side collision and get 32 miles on a gallon, which isn't, wasn't bad in those days. They took those remaining, uh, the Department of Transportation with the encouragement of the industry and they destroyed them. And they destroyed the research capacity for fuel efficiency of the agency, and they really wrecked the research. It couldn't stand a technological frame of reference larger than what they were saying they could do in, uh, in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And you saw the documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? Yeah. yeah. And now the vault was coming back. You see, I went to the World's Fa- uh, Fair in 1939, was it? Yeah, with my parents. I was just a little boy. And I saw the big GM Futurama uh, building. It was the biggest. And I ran ahead of my parents excitedly saying, GM, GM, GM. Little did they know. At, at any rate, 
uh, you got inside and it had all these dramatic futuristic uh, things for engines and composite materials and so on. We're still waiting. They dangle the electric car for a few years. Then they say, oh, just can't work. There's no interest. And then a few years pass and they dangle it again. Now they're dangling the hydrogen car. It's all manipulation. What are you doing now with your cars? What did you do 10 years ago with your car? When you had plenty of lead time, what are you giving us in terms of fuel efficiency, emission control, composite materials? So that's a very important point you make. Uh, and that's where companies like Google can come in. So you don't have to get deeply involved in political controversies. You just have to create the, create the conditions, the stimuli, the framework, the, the, the window opening to change the parameters. But it takes extremely careful throughput thinking. Throughput, constantly saying, Knowledge for what? Knowledge for what? Knowledge for what? Knowledge for what? What are the barriers? Uh, biggest barrier is the concentration of power in too few hands. Vested interests. Yeah. Our uh, complex and confusing measurement system costs us heavily, both in societal level and financially. What are your thoughts on cleaning up this measurement mess and getting us finally completely under metric? You mean to the metric system? Yeah, that's beyond me. I mean, as you know, there's a commission years ago, and they thought they were going to finally turn the corner in the United States. And there's a lot of resistance, grassroots resistance, uh, to losing the inch and the, and the foot and the yard and the pound. And I think they've, they seem to have stalled in, in, in the conversion. I guess Canada has conver converted. Um, i got to pass on that. Uh, by the way, you talk about freedom a lot in the company, right? Mm -hmm. Let me give you the best definition of freedom I've ever heard, and it's 2,100 years old. Marcus Cicero. How many people here have ever heard of Marcus Cicero? Okay. A very wise Ro ancient Roman orator. Freedom is participation in power. Whenever you talk about freedom in your literature, are you talking about participation in power by the masses? That's what freedom is. I mean, by that measure, citizens don't have that much freedom. They have personal freedom. Buy what they want, marry who they want, travel where they want, eat where they want. That's personal freedom. You, you got that in a lot of dictatorships. The key is civic freedom to shape the future. How much voice do we have on foreign and military policy or the federal budget or something as simple as labeling food products if they're genetically engineered? 90% want it. Monsanto doesn't. Monsanto wins. Monsanto doesn't have a vote. 90% of the people do. Is that democracy? No. Yes. So you already mentioned the presidential debates. If you were in charge of YouTube and could do anything radical and interesting with it, what would you do? I missed that. If uh, I was if president you, of YouTube... If what? you were in charge of YouTube yeah. and could do anything radical and interesting with it, along some of the things you kind of mentioned... Right. What would you do? I would develop a scenario where I could get the biggest possible audience that the major candidates can't turn down. Okay? That's one. Then, how do you get the major candidates to show up with the two or three candidates who are going to be on enough electoral college votes to theoretically be able to win? That's the big bridge that you have to cross. They can say no to you. You know, Obama, Clinton, McCain. They can say no to you. Even if you say, I'm going to deliver 20 million people to the audience. But you've got to have um, the number three person, number two or three person uh, independent third party candidates. If you just do third party candidates, uh, independent candidates, you know, it'll be a plus, but it won't have that, that electricity. Uh, look what Perot did. He was number three and he shot up in the polls when he was on the major debates in 1992. And then they kept him off in 96 because the debate commission is controlled by the two parties. Anybody want? First, I'd urge you to go to opendebates.org for a lot of the material that you might be looking for about the history and the complex of the debate commission. And, and the second is uh, stay in touch with us. Um, that's a very important question to us, obviously. And we can think through this. 
I know you're thinking of doing something in New Orleans, is that right? Yes. Yeah. I'm not on the YouTube team. Sorry. Yeah. That's, well, that's what I was, I was just told, and that would be good. But, I mean, you, you, you will get the major candidates, uh, but will you get the major candidates uh, and the breakthrough candidates with, with ideas that are majoritarian proposals? Our, our proposals are majoritarian proposals, one area after another. You can take it any way. Polls, focus groups, you name it. It's not like, you know, we're the fountain of wisdom. It's that when we stand for justice for the people instead of subservience to powerful interests, it's not surprising that a majority of the people support it. But by that token, we should get a hearing. Opening up the presidential debates, overwhelming support for that. 64% in the Fox poll wanted me on those debates in 2000. Didn't matter. Yes, uh, thank you for coming. One thing that I was a little concerned about when you spoke was a, perhaps an a, assumption that business and large corporations are inherently not a force for good. Maybe perhaps you would consider it naive, but I do believe that large corporations have a place in this society and our economy and, and actually can be not just a force for job creation, but for innovation and, and creativity. And I, I think that um, when you talk about democracy being so important, I think that when you worry about just as 50% plus one enough to make something possible, right now in this economy, we have a lot of pressure for protectionism. There may be a majority that believe in, don't believe in the free good, uh, travel of goods and services between countries, that don't believe that immigration should be allowed to continue at today's rate, that don't want more H-1B visas. Whereas I think at Google, we've, we've really lobbied to get more immigration to allow the most talented people to travel. And if that drives down, perhaps the, the, the salaries of some people, I don't know, so be it. But I think that people should have the opportunity to do things like that. And if we say that you, it's always a majority, we really can have that tyranny of the majority. And I think that that, that could be a very dangerous uh, form of populism. That's true. That's very true, especially in the constitutional rights area. That's very true. It's free speech, for example, civil liberties. Um, but I'm, I don't have time to give you the evidence as to why people, I mean, people intuitively like more voices and choices, right? So they want to open up the president to debate. They intuitively say that if you work full time, you should have enough to get the bare necessities for your family and a living wage. We're not talking about more difficult shades of gray here. We're really talking about fundamental fairness as perceived by people everywhere. The H-1B visa is very tricky. On the one hand, we're saying, why doesn't the third world develop faster? Uh, well, the third world needs entrepreneurs, they need doctors, nurses, they need engineers, scientists. Why are we brain draining the world when we have millions of young people in this country who aren't given the opportunity to fill those roles, those skilled roles? I think, it, I think it's very coarse on our part to brain drain the world. I know if you've read Obama's uh, technology policy, and on the one hand, he says that you know, he, he wants uh, a rational immigration policy, et cetera. And, and then he says, uh, you know, we should, uh, we should give, uh, uh, we should give uh, anybody who gets a PhD in important areas as a foreign student should be allowed to stay here. Well, what about back home? They need agronomists. They need people who know how to deal with uh, clean drinking water, engineering systems. They need all kinds of people. What are we doing? Brain draining nurses and doctors. Uh, it's like a vicious circle, and it goes down and down. And these people say, oh, there aren't any opportunities. Yeah, well, a good way to make sure no opportunities to bring the entrepreneurs and scientists and engineers here. It's not a good foreign aid uh, policy. But I agree with you. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, majority should tyrannize the minority here. Ver having been a minority voice for a long time, I, I, I understand what you're talking about. Well, even at Google, we run out of time. So we have time for one more question. Uh, so the Founding Fathers uh, distributed power uh, in the Constitution through a, a system of checks and balances. Uh, if corporations have taken too much of the power away from the many uh, voters, what can we do from a legislative and constitutional perspective uh, to redistribute the power where it belongs? Well, there's a traditional responses like public funding and public campaigns to reduce the power of commercial money in uh, campaigns. And uh, more and more, the Internet's providing okay. a source for small 
funds. Developing. Uh, Do we have evidence that'll fundamentally fix the system? No, it, but it, 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 the fundamental way to fix the system is to strip corporations of equal constitutional rights with human beings. You can't have equal justice under law and have artificial entities, not employees, artificial entities called corporations have all our constitutional rights except the Fifth Amendment. And then they have such an ability to concentrate power, transcend governments. Uh, okay, but how? Have, well, it can be done statutorily. It could be done constitutionally. There's no, no mention of a corporation in the Constitution. And corporations were given status as persons under the 14th Amendment, equal protection laws, by a hooked-up Supreme Court decision in 1886. It really was hooked up. It was the, the head notes, actually, that said that this railroad company uh, they, uh, has equal rights with human beings. And then the other Supreme Court uh, decisions followed that way. But notice, it wasn't congressional, uh, and it wasn't constitutional. So it could come from statute. It could come from a constitutional amendment. Business Week actually editorialized eight years ago, said politics should get out of politics, meaning they're not human beings. They don't vote. Uh, they don't have children. They don't die in Iraq. What are they doing as an entity having those kinds of access to our elections and political system and political institutions? I mean, if individuals want to go and express their opinion, uh, fine, but not corporations. And what happens when we give them equal rights we almost violate a biblical injunction. We give the merchant class commercial values enormous power over civil, civic values. Health, safety, access to justice, longer view toward posterity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that's what really the conflict is in societies uh, that are, don't have raw dictatorships. It's how much commercial values are going to be given power compared to civic values. Like, there, in any democracy, there have to be sanctuaries when nothing's for sale. See, childhood should not be for sale to marketeers. Government should not be for sale. Elections should not be for sale. University, nonprofit university should not be for sale. There have to be sanctuaries where the sign on the door is not for sale if we are going to balance better the civil civic values with commercial values. And it, when the corporations were first chartered in 1800 in Massachusetts, the modern corporation, the idea was the corporation was going to be our servant, not our master. And, uh, you know, I've written books on how our corporations are masters. There have been articles, hearings, reports. It's no big deal. 60 minutes, you name it. Increasingly, uh, the sovereignty of the people is being subser subservient uh, to the power of multinational corporations. Uh, so the answer is just that. We've got to deal with the issue of corporate personhood, and that's going to be dealt with on our website, votenator.org, alongside a lot of other inform information. Regardless of whether you uh, want to vote or not or want to contribute or not as volunteers, just log into the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to our email. Give us your email, and you'll see an alternative framework for presidential politics. And, and that includes efforts that are not around a presidential bid, but also in changing legislation? Oh, yeah. I mean, it'll get more and more detailed. We had huge detail in 04. People said, you got too much detail. So we started out simple, and now we're going to uh, expand it uh, prudently so we don't overload uh, people. Thank you. But I come back to the key thing. Watch out for self-censorship. The greatest censorship in our society is self-censorship. You see it in technical meetings, scientific meetings, meetings of lawyers, and of course, politicians. You see it everywhere. You can tell after a while. Why are they suppressing their own best instincts? Or what they really know is the truth. I mean, I would go years ago to a traffic safety convention, engineers, scientists, public health specialists, insurance people. <laughs> they would never talk about the vehicle. They talk about the driver. They talk about the highway once in a while. But human factors, you know, doesn't leave out the vehicle. And they would go year after year and never talk about the vehicle because there was people from General Motors and Ford and so on. The same is true with professional societies who set standards, like the Society of Automotive Engineers. If you want an analog to my caution, 
that don't get too excited about the information revolution and access to the Internet. When radio started out in 1928 Radio Act, there was huge debate. Herbert Hoover wanted radio to be radio stations to be nonprofit and no advertising. Herbert Hoover. So there's this big fight between the nonprofit crowd and non-advertising because it was considered a public trust and the commercial desire to take uh, over radio. Guess who won? Same with cable. Cable was said, hey, if you pay a monthly fee, you won't see any ads. Hello. <laughs> see, you got to, power has its own imperative. Power can distort the potential benefits of technology. And in some cases, turn it against the supposed beneficiaries, like automotive emissions. Like, you know, any of the technologies that have finally been tamed. You ask, why is it taking so long? How many people here think they censor themselves? How, let, let me ask a fairer question. How many people here in the last month have been in a meeting at Google and they've censored themselves? And how many people have never censored themselves? So the majority, what? You got this under contemplation? This question? That's the first thing. Every organization of your size should deal with that. I understand some people are leaving Google, start their own startups because they think it's too big. Is that true? A few. Yeah. Well, you'll see that. I mean, that's natural. But uh, the key is always, what's it for? How can it improve the life of people all over the world? That's, when, that's what we really mean when we say information is the currency of democracy. You know, there, there was a law professor, a great law professor, Kenneth Culp Davis. He was an administrative law professor. And he wrote a, a technical article in a journal. And he said, tell me one idea political scientists have come forward that has helped government run itself better. And he, he, didn't, he didn't think there was one idea. Lots of political scientists. Um, I mean, that's a rather simple question. And it, you can have a quibble with it. But we know a lot more than we're applying. I'll leave you with an ancient Chinese proverb. How the hell they ever got so wise without email? This is 2,500 years old, Matt. Once you hear it, you'll never forget it. To know and not to do is not to know. To know and not to do is not to know. Like any proverb, it's exaggerated, but it has a very, very important kernel of truth for it. And you've just got to deploy your skills in an ever broader plateau. There's just, there are too many skills in too few pockets in this country. And they're not moving out in other areas of dire need. It's the same with the lawyers, you know. 80% of the lawyers represent 20% of the people, and you got millions of people without legal representation. Uh, same with doctors. You see many doctors in poor areas? You see many specialists in highly densely populated poor areas? So that, that, that's what's involved. I'm just throwing out some thoughts here, Matt, because there should be longer conversations. You should hold constant public hearings all over the country. Because the more technical and complex you get, the sh smaller your audience of understanding becomes. Fewer and fewer people can understand what you're doing. I speak as a member of a profession that's perfected that kind of jargon. So the legal profession. You should always have public hearings all over. Uh, bring people in. Um, answer their questions person to person rather than through screens. And you'll get a different kind of press as well. The FCC had some of these hearings. Uh, it was good. They had hearings in Seattle, hearings in Atlanta on media ownership. It was very, very good in that point of view. I still believe that there's a difference between communicating through screens and communicating person to person. Well, we, we thank you for being here. We look forward to this being the first of many conversations. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.